Alright, there were a lot of requests for a sequel to What If Ash Woke Up On Time, so let's keep things going. If you haven't seen the original video, then it's linked in the description so you can check it out there. The first video only covered 80 episodes, but this time we're going through all of the Orange Islands in Johto, so there are almost 200 episodes worth of content in front of us. Just in case you need a refresher, this is an in-depth look at how things may have played out in a world where Ash Ketchum woke up on time on the day he picked his starter. Anyway, there's lots to talk about here, so let's get started. After finishing up at the Indigo Plateau Conference, Ash and Brock return to Pallet Town for a celebration of Gary's victory. There's plenty of praise for Ash, but Gary is the centre of attention. Without the interference of Team Rocket, everything goes off without a hitch. That means no interruption from the Spearow flock, so there is no Pidgeotto evolution or release. While talking to Professor Oak though, Ash and Brock are informed that he has set Gary a task in the Orange Archipelago. The Archipelago? Oak tells them that he's sending Gary to meet with Professor Ivy on Valencia Island. She has discovered a mysterious Pokeball and it needs to be collected and delivered back to Kanto's Pokemon Professor. Oak says that Ash and Brock should accompany Gary, so despite his protests, the trio head off together. How long is it going to take us to get to this place? If we have to walk, I think about a month or so. Did Ash just suggest that they could walk to Valencia Island? Does he know how islands work? Anyway, our trio get lucky winning a free blimp trip to Valencia, so we won't get to see Ash walking on water, unfortunately. At the same time, completely unrelated to our protagonist's journey, Giovanni puts Jesse, James, and Meowth in charge of flying the blimp. That's got nothing to do with his faith in them, rather the opposite. Giovanni believes that with those three in charge, the blimp is sure to crash and he can cash in on the insurance money. The whole trip is a bit of a disaster, but luckily when the blimp crash lands, it happens to be on Valencia Island. After reaching Professor Ivy's lab, she shows and then hands over the GS ball to Gary. Seeing the mess that Ivy leaves in her wake, Brock decides to stay behind as her assistant slash cleaner. That means Ash and Gary are now a duo for the foreseeable future. They're tasked with returning the GS ball to Professor Oak, so return to Pallet Town by Blimp. In the alternate timeline, the Blimp crashes again, but without the interference of Team Rocket and Jigglypuff, it arrives safely this time around. That has a number of consequences. It means that Ash never meets Tracy, he never catches Lapras or Snorlax, and most importantly, he never becomes the Orange League champion. So we've got one of those very rare occasions where someone would have been better off had their aircraft crashed. Anyway, Ash and Gary return to Pallet Town and hand over the GS ball to Professor Oak. Unsure of exactly what to do with it, Oak returns it to them and sends them onwards to Johto. That's where Kurt lives and as an ostensible ball expert, he should be the perfect person to examine it. Nobody knows balls better than Kurt. Ash and Gary start by heading for New Barktown to meet with Professor Elm and register for the Johto League. Ash only brings along his Blastoise, Bulbasaur and Charmeleon, choosing to leave the rest of his Kanto Pokemon behind. On their way to Violet City, Ash and Gary both catch new Pokemon to add to their teams. The lack of interference from Jesse and James means there's no conflict, but Ash still catches the Heracross who latches onto Bulbasaur while Gary goes off to Pinsir. They both had a bug type, and this actually coincides with the original timeline. Although we never see Gary's Pinsir in use, it is revealed before the Johto Pokemon League that he did in fact catch one. Continuing onwards to Johto's first gym, Gary catches a Hoot Hoot to lead the duo through a dark forest. Although Brock isn't there to show Ash how to flirt with a Startler, the young normal type is too injured to escape. Ash catches it so we can get it back to Professor Oak as quickly as possible to recover. So that's a new Pokemon, although it's going back to Pallet Town for now. Then on a mountainous trail outside of Cherry Grove City, Ash battles a wild Chikorita with his Bulbasaur and Charmeleon, eventually leading to a catch. This one sticks around, so we're already up to five with Blastoise, Bulbasaur, Charmeleon, Heracross, and Chikorita. After the lengthy journey from New Bark Town to Cherry Grove, there's virtually nothing worth saying about the trip from Cherry Grove on to Violet. So, with Ash and Gary in Violet City, we're now into the first gym battles of the video. Having seen Gary's Indigo Plateau Conference victory, Faulkner is keen to battle him first, much to Ash's chagrin. While Ash flounces towards the stands to watch on, Faulkner goes over the rules with Gary. It will be a 3 on 3 face off, and when the Violet Gym Leader sends out his Hoot Hoot, Gary follows Suit Suit. It seems to be a way for Gary to put his newest Pokemon through its paces, but it's just not up to scratch. Faulkner's Hoot Hoot is well trained, and its speed is too much for its opponent. Peck ends up handing Faulkner the first win of the match, so Gary sends out his Arcanine. Not interested in losing his first Johto gym battle, Gary focuses up and bides his time. Waiting for Hoot Hoot to close the distance when it moves in to use Peck, Gary calls for Fire Blast. The flames flatten Hoot Hoot, tying up the match. Faulkner's ends in his Dodrio, and as it's up against Arcanine, the two test their speed. Dodrio dodges a Fire Blast by leaping into the air when Faulkner calls for Fly, and then Arcanine sidesteps a Drill Peck. When Gary calls for Fire Spin, Faulkner instructs Dodrio to fly once more, falling right into Gary's trap. 
Arcanine aims a fire blast right where Dodrio is set to land and it can't change direction in the air. The three-headed bird is burnt to a crisp upon landing, leaving Faulkner with only his Pidgeot. Knowing that Arcanine's speed can be a problem, the gym leader calls for agility which allows Pidgeot to dodge a takedown. After a speedy back and forth, Pidgeot eventually gets the better of Arcanine with a wing attack. Nidoqueen's up last for Gary and she's almost immediately struck by a quick attack. Having failed to land a couple of attacks, Gary decides to lie and wait once more. As Pidgeot dive bombs for a wing attack, Nidoqueen aims a mega punch in front of her face and the flying type speed does the rest. Fist crunches against Beak and the pace of the collision works against Pidgeot. It's a knockout punch that earns Gary the Zephyr Badge with Ash watching on from the stands. Faulkner tells Ash that his Pokemon need time to rest so he'll have to come back tomorrow if he wants to battle. Being forced to watch has given Ash the advantage though. He's learned a lot from watching Faulkner and developed a strategy of his own. As he did in the original timeline, Ash starts things out with Chikorita because really he doesn't have much of a choice. Heracross and Bulbasaur aren't great options either. For his face off with Ash, Faulkner switches things up and begins with Dodrio. Chikorita starts with a Vine Whip which Dodrio casually dodges by leaping into the air. Taking a page out of Gary's playbook though, Ash tells his newest Pokemon to aim a razor leaf where Dodrio is set to land. The leaves take Dodrio off its feet but it shakes it off sprinting at Chikorita. When it reaches the Grass Starter, it strikes with a Drill Peck that scores an easy knockout. Ash calls on his trusted Blastoise next who's no match for Dodrio speed wise but that's not all that matters. After connecting with the Vicious Fury attack, Dodrio retreats and Blastoise takes that opportunity to send a Hydro Pump blasting into its two side heads. It washes away Dodrio, taking the battle into a 2 on 2. Hoot Hoot's in second for Faulkner, but it's just not on Blastoise's level. Without even managing to land an attack, Blastoise takes down the Owl, giving Ash the advantage in his first Johto Gym battle. When Pidgeot comes in, Faulkner once again relies on agility. With the speed boost in play, Blastoise really struggles to hit the bird. Pidgeot's able to strike repeatedly with Wing Attack and Quick Attack and Ash has no idea how to deal with it. Eventually, Faulkner's persistence pays off and Wing Attack takes the battle into a one-on-one. -on -one. Charmeleon's up last for Ash and although Flamethrower clips Pidgeot, it has similar problems with landing a direct hit. After another agility, Faulkner continues calling for Quick Attack, frustrating Charmeleon more and more with every strike. Angered by its inability to counter, Charmeleon evolves into Charizard, taking the battle into the sky. Speed is no longer an issue for Ash as Charizard is able to make its way behind Pidgeot, connecting with a flamethrower to earn Ash the win. Alright, that's a strong star. Ash and Gary have both earned the Zephyr badge, so it's time to leave Violet City behind and head for Azalea Town. Even though Charizard is much more obedient in this timeline, it still wants to stay behind to get stronger in the Charizard Valley, so sticks with Liza to train. After moving on from there, Ash and Gary find themselves lost in a forest between Violet and Azalea. Learning that there are potentially Cyndaquil nearby, Ash is keen to replace his recently lost fire type. Once again, we don't have to deal with Team Rocket's intervention, but the result is no different. Ash catches Cyndaquil to take his team back to 5. When Ash and Gary finally make it out and reach Azalea Town, it's in the middle of a blazing hot drought and they come across two men dressed in Slowpoke suits. They are tempted to draw the real Slowpoke out into the open, believing they'll be able to bring the rain back to Azalea. As it turns out, the two men are Kurt and Brock. Having finished up with Ivy, Brock went back to Pallet Town and heard from Professor Oak where Ash was headed. The former pewter gym leader travels straight for Azalea Town where he's been helping out Kurt while waiting for Ash to show up. Eventually, the group succeed in drawing out the Slowpoke and their yawns begin the rain. Whether or not it's a massive coincidence, we'll never know, but it really doesn't matter, so let's move on. Once Gary has handed the GS ball off to Kurt, he heads away, leaving Ash and Brock behind, claiming that they'll only slow him down. After sticking around with Kurt for a bit longer, Ash and Brock visit the Azalea Gym, where Bugsy lets them know that Gary has already come and gone, earning the Hive Badge. Anyway, it's going to be another 3 on 3 battle and Ash decides to get things going with his Cyndaquil. Bugsy starts with Spinarak and when the fire starter can't get its flame going, Ash recalls it and sends in Blastoise. The powerful water type digs down on entry, upending Spinarak upon emerging from below the battlefield to score the knockout. Bugsy sends in his Metapod next and after using Harden, it's washed away by a Hydro Pump from Blastoise, quickly leaving Bugsy in a 1 on 3. Scyther comes in last for the Azalea Gym Leader and starts things off with a Sword Stance. Blastoise really struggles to do much against the speedy bug, only landing a single hit. Before too long, Fury Cutter takes down Blastoise, bringing Bugsy back into the match. Ash sends Cyndaquil back in next, and this time it's fired up enough to get its flame going. Just like in the original timeline, Cyndaquil is able to strike from above with Flamethrower to score Ash the win. Bugsy hands over the Hive Badge, taking Ash's total to two and leaving his badge case a quarter full. Having moved on from Azalea Town, Ash comes across a Totodile who he's desperate to catch. Using a lure ball that he received from Kurt and without the competition from Misty, Ash manages to catch it easily to make it 3 from 3 on the Johto starters. 
Then in Ilex Forest, Ash encounters a shiny Noctowl who he attempts to catch. It's a tough battle with Noctowl getting the better of a couple of Ash's Pokemon, but Blastoise manages to knock it out of the air with Hydro Pump. Ash catches the shiny Pokemon and then to ensure he can keep it on hand, sends Bulbasaur back to Professor Oak. That's everything that needs covering between Azalea and Goldenrod, so Ash vs Whitney's up next. The Goldenrod Gym Leader leads off with her Clefairy, and for the first time, Ash sends out his Heracross. The Bug Fighting type charges down Clefairy for a takedown as Whitney calls for Metronome. That turns into a Leech Seed which hits Heracross square, tying it up and stopping its takedown. The move gradually saps Heracross's health as Whitney calls for Metronome again. This time it turns into a Fire Punch which badly injures Heracross but also frees it from Leech Seed. Ash calls for a takedown once again and as the third time is the charm, Clefairy's Metronome is a splash. Heracross clatters into the Flopping Fairy which thanks to Recoil results in a double KO. Ash and Whitney throw out their second Pokeballs, releasing Blastoise and Nidorina. That's a lucky break for Ash who calls for Dig sending his first ever Pokemon straight underground. Poison Sting arrives too late to connect with Blastoise beneath the battlefield. Surfacing to strike, Blastoise sends Nidorina flying into the air with Dig and by the time she lands, Whitney's down to one. Miltank comes in and Whitney immediately calls for Rollout. It's too fast for Blastoise to use Dig to avoid, so the fully evolved Water Starter is knocked off its feet. Ash recalls Blastoise and sends in Noctowl who can avoid Rollout by sticking to the skies. Miltank's second run of Rollout can't reach the shiny flyer above the battlefield, so Hypnosis connects to put her to sleep. With the cow snoozing, Noctowl has no problem finishing the battle with repeated pecks. That earns Ash the plane badge in some style, with back-to-back gym -back successes coming without losing a second team member. In the National Park just outside of Goldenrod, Ash decides to enter a bug catching contest in an attempt to find a new bug type Pokemon. Just like in the alternate timeline, Ash catches a Beedrill that's good enough to earn him the win. That gets him a brand new Pokemon and a Sunstone. In the original timeline, Ash gives the Beedrill to Casey, but he doesn't know her in this version, so for now, the bee is headed back to Oak and Pallet Town. Alright, next up on the way to Ecritique City, Brock runs into Susie again and returns her Vulpix to her. That's not terribly important to the video, but it happens, so yeah. Just before making it into Ecritique, Ash enters another competition, this time a Grass-type battle tournament. With Bulbasaur back at Oaks, Ash uses Chikorita, falling in the final to a Skip Loon. That's all of the important bits between Goldenrod and Ecritique, so let's check out Ash vs Morty. This one actually plays out very similarly to the original timeline. The only major change is the swap of Ash replacing Pikachu with Blastoise. As his original starter contributed precisely nothing in this battle, Blastoise just makes things a little bit easier. In this timeline, Ash's starter gets the better of Ghastly before falling to Haunter. Cyndaquil then makes its biggest contribution thus far by knocking out Haunter, but Gengar is a bridge too far. As it did in the anime, Noctowl then goes Talon to Ghostly Toe with Gengar eventually causing the upset to earn Ash the Fog Badge. That makes four, and with a choice between Olivine and Mahogany next, Ash and Brock decide to head for the beach. Once they reach the city by the sea, they head straight for the gym, but Jasmine's not there. She is of course tending to Ampharos and sends Ash on to Seanwood City to pick up some medicine. After picking it up, Ash learns of a gym on the island and heads straight over. Chuck's in charge there, and for the first time in Johto, Ash will be in a 2 on 2 gym battle. Everything gets going with Chuck's Poliwrath facing off against Ash's Chikorita. The gym leader calls for double slap, but Chikorita's Vine Whip keeps Poliwrath from closing the distance. Retreating to avoid the vines, Poliwrath fires a water gun at Chikorita that washes her back towards Ash. Razorleaf peppers Poliwrath from across the battlefield, but it's not enough for a knockout. After the attack, Poliwrath successfully gets in close and lands two powerful blows with double slap. Badly injured but desperate to impress Ash, Chikorita evolves into Bayleaf attacking again with Razorleaf. The newly evolved Grass-type now has enough power to get the knockout, so Ash has the lead in yet another gym battle. Chuck sends out his Machoke, and with the adrenaline wearing off, Bayleaf can't stay in the battle for long. Ash is forced to recall her and send in Noctowl before she's taken down. The Flying-type speeds towards Machoke for a pet, but Chuck's Pokémon are trained well. It sidesteps the bird and lands a Karate Chop as it flies by. After a few more attempts to attack up close, Ash realizes that it's no use. Instead, he calls for Confusion, which Noctowl lands, throwing Machoke backwards. Ash instructs Noctowl to use Hypnosis next, which succeeds, putting Machoke to sleep. Sensing the end, Ash calls for Peck, but as soon as Noctowl's in close enough, Machoke awakens, striking with Cross Chop for the win. Bayleaf returns to battle, having only recovered slightly from earlier. Machoke runs towards Bayleaf going for submission, but she escapes the hole by using her vines to fly into the air. Ash calls for Body Slam, and for the first time, Bayleaf uses her new move. She lands squarely on top of Machoke, crushing the fighting type to earn Ash the Storm Badge. That's number 5, and having collected the medicine in Seanwood, Ash and Brock begin their trip back to Olivine City. Before returning to face Jasmine, Ash finds himself in the Whirl Islands just in time for the World Cup. 
It's a battle tournament for water type Pokemon only, and with Brock keen to get some battle practice, he decides to enter too. Psyduck is already in his party, and as they're on an island, he certainly can catch a second water type before the tournament begins. Knowing that there's a partial rock type commonly found in the area, Brock searches out and succeeds in catching a Corsola. With that, the tournament begins. Ash and Brock breeze through the preliminary rounds with Totodile taking down a seal and Corsola easily besting a Magikarp in the first round. Then, in the second preliminary round, Totodile and Corsola go again, beating a Shelder and a Sea King respectively. That advances Ash and Brock to the tournament proper. For Ash, the round of 64 plays out identically to the original timeline, with Totodile picking up an unlikely win against Christopher's Kingdra. Brock sticks with Corsola for the round of 64 as he comes up against a Quillfish owned by Harrison, who I'm pretty sure is Professor Oak in disguise. It's a close match, but Brock's newly caught Corsola is no pushover. With Mirror Coat and Recover, it's incredibly tough to beat and ends up getting Brock over the line. In the next round, Ash and Brock are drawn against one another for the 2 on 2 matchup. The battle begins with Totodile facing off against Corsola, and although it's close, Brock picks up the first win of the match with a Mirror Coat. Ash has saved Blastoise until now, though. While Corsola is recovering from the face-off with Totodile, Blastoise lands a Hydro Pump that takes the battle into a one-on-one. -on -one. Psyduck comes out for the final face-off, but without Blastoise ever getting close to triggering confusion, it's an easy win for the fully evolved Kanto starter. Next up, in the round of 16, Ash faces off against Trinity, and after Totodile falls to Gyarados, Blastoise avenges the Toothy Reptile. Trinity calls on her Chinchou second, and unfortunately for Ash, the small platforms don't really leave any space for Blastoise to use Dig. After a close-fought battle, Chinchou Spark gets Trinity the win, so Ash falls just before the quarterfinals. Having got to know Trinity a bit, Ash and Brock stick around until the final day to see how she does. Trinity does indeed reach the final, where she faces off against a red-headed trainer from Cerulean City named Misty. The battle reaches its conclusion with a Gyarados vs Gyarados matchup, with a couple of Hyper Beams colliding. Misty's Gyarados wins out, so she's awarded the Mystic Water Pendant, and with that, Ash and Brock can move on. After returning to Olivine City with the medicine, it's time for Ash's gym battle against Jasmine. Calling on Magnemite first, Jasmine's surprised to see Ash lead off with a Water-type Blastoise. Magnemite goes for an early Thunder Wave, but Ash calls for Dig, so Blastoise dives underground. Hovering above the battlefield, Magnemite doesn't know where to look, and just as its gaze settles on Ash, he shouts for Blastoise to surface. Dig connects on Magnemite's blind side, and it hits the ground hard, skidding along and coming to a stop at Ash's feet. The quad effective blast leads to an easy knockout, immediately leaving Jasmine with one. When Steelix comes in, Jasmine tries to get ahead of the game by calling for Dig before Ash can. With no intention of waiting for the battle to be taken to him, he also calls for Dig, so both Pokemon are under the battlefield now. After a while, with the ground beneath the battlefield almost destroyed, Steelix and Blastoise both attack, coming together in a crunching impact. Jasmine's ace doesn't come out of it too well, but its steely frame destroys Blastoise. Ash calls on his Cyndaquil next, and as Steelix begins slithering towards the tiny fire starter, the ground beneath it gives way. Jasmine pleads for an Iron Tail, but Steelix is pinned down and surrounded by the debris from the destroyed battlefield. Cyndaquil has the simple job of firing a flamethrower at the stationary target, knocking out Steelix for the win. Now that the Mineral Badge is filling the sixth slot in his badge case, Ash can continue onwards to Mahogany Town. On the way there, Ash enters the Extreme Pokemon race with Bayleaf, but without Team Rocket present, Gary wins with his Arcanine. As a reward, he receives a Pokemon Egg that went to Ash in the alternate timeline. That's the last important event worth covering before Ash and Brock reach Mahogany Town, so let's move on to that. There's quite a serious change up here. As Jesse and James aren't following Ash and Pikachu, Price doesn't coincidentally find his Piloswine. Instead, Ash has to beat him in a one-on-one -on -one face off to earn the chance to take him on at the gym. With the help of Heracross, he does just that, defeating Dugong for the win. That means that Price doesn't have his ace on hand for the gym battle, and also, he's still pretty damn miserable. Instead, he selects Dugong once more and uses a Shelter as his second team member. After losing by the Waterfall, Price is demoralized, so Heracross and Bayleaf can quite easily defeat his chosen duo. So, as it turns out, if Ash woke up on time, things would be pretty terrible for Price. Sorry, Price. Anyway, that makes seven, so let's jump forward to Blackthorn City. There's nothing of much interest to us prior to Ash's battle with Claire, so that's our next stop. It's the final Johto gym battle, and it'll be back to basics with another 3 on 3 face off. The battle begins with Claire's Kingdra taking on Ash's Noctowl. A Hydro Pump clips the bird as it fails with Hypnosis, but after dodging an attack, Noctowl hits with Confusion. Eventually, after Swift connects for Kingdra and Peck lands for Noctowl, a Hyper Beam finishes things to give Claire the lead. Ash quickly sends Blastoise into battle while Kingdra's recharging, so his starter can debut its new move. Blastoise strikes Kingdra with Ice Punch, scoring the knockout to level up the match. 
Claire sends out her Gyarados next, and after a back and forth battle, Ice Punch and Bite connect simultaneously, leading to a double KO. That takes Ash and Claire into a one on one, which sees Dratini taking on Bailey. The face off is tense, with the grass type getting the better hits, but before Dratini faints, she evolves into Dragonair to up her chances in battle. Before Bailey can get off her Razor Leaf, Dragonair's Thunder Wave leaves her paralyzed. Unable to get out of the way, Bailey can only watch on as a Hyper Beam crashes into her. That's the final action of the match as it knocks out Bayleaf to hand Claire the win. So, for the first time, Ash has been unsuccessful in a Johto Gym challenge. After a few days off, Ash returns to the Blackthorn Gym for a rematch. As her strategy was a winning one, Claire keeps things simple and starts with Kingdra once again. This time around, Ash leads off with his Blastoise who was able to get the better of the Water Dragon last time out. Claire calls for a Hyper Beam right away but it fails to connect thanks to Dig. Blastoise strikes while Kingdra's recharging, but the close proximity means Swift can hit the water starter hard. Both Pokemon then go for Hydro Pumps, and although Blastoise's wins out, it barely phases Kingdra. As it needs no time to recover, Kingdra's able to attack with a Hyper Beam that badly injures Blastoise, leaving it on the cusp of fainting. Kingdra needs to recharge though, so while it's locked in position, Blastoise summons one last ounce of energy, lumbering towards it to strike with an Ice Punch that gives Ash the lead. When Claire sends in her Gyarados, Ash recalls Blastoise so it can have some time to rest. In a surprise to Claire, Ash calls on Charizard next, who has returned from the Charizard Valley to help out in the battle. Gyarados starts things by going for Hydro Pump, which Charizard rolls past in the air, getting in close to land a wing attack. Before recovering from the hit, Gyarados is burnt up by a flamethrower, but turns just in time to deal some damage with a Hydro Pump. It's not a clean hit, but it's super effective, so it works all the same. Charizard uses its speed to land another wing attack before another Hydro Pump clips the fire starter. Instead of calling for another water type attack, when Charizard goes for a third wing attack, Claire calls for bite and it works perfectly. Gyarados is weakened by another attack, but a powerful bite critically injures Charizard. As a last ditch effort, Ash calls for flamethrower and Gyarados relinquishes its grip, firing off a hyper beam. The devastating blast both connect, scoring knockouts for both sides. Claire sends in her final Pokemon Dragonair and Ash sends Blastoise back into battle. Having only recovered a small amount, the ice punch that Blastoise starts with is slow and much weaker than normal. It knocks Dragonair backwards, but she quickly recovers and summons Thunder from above. It scores a direct hit, and the Thundercrack is more than enough to take the Pallet Town native down to his final Pokemon. Ash throws out the third Pokeball he selected, and in another surprise to Claire, it's the normal type Stauntler. Having fully recovered and grown a lot with Oak, Stauntler is now more than ready for battle. Ash starts by calling for takedown as Claire instructs Dragonair to use Iron Tail. Before fully readying for her attack though, Stauntler collides with Dragonair, throwing her backwards. She slithers around and fires off a Dragon Rage as Stauntler goes for Confuse Ray. Dragonair's attack lands, but she's confused by Confuse Ray all the same. Claire calls for Thunder, but Dragonair almost electrocutes herself thanks to Confusion. With Claire's ace off her game, Stauntler goes for Hypnosis, which puts her right to sleep. Claire's expecting a takedown, but Ash's Stauntler has another surprise in store. Dream Eater begins draining Dragonair's HP and returning Stauntler to full health. Before Dream Eater completely wipes her out, Dragonair awakens, snapping out of Confusion and using Thunder once more. It connects with Stauntler who does its best to shake it off and charges at Dragonair with takedown. This time around, Iron Tail is ready when Stauntler reaches Dragonair so the attacks land simultaneously. The combined damage of Iron Tail and Recoil leaves Stauntler weak, but its takedown eliminates Dragonair to hand Ash the win. Claire is full of praise for Charizard and Stauntler handing over the Rising Badge to fill Ash's case and qualify him for the Silver Conference. There's a few months between the Blackthorn Gym Battle and the Johto Pokemon League so Ash continues his training. Along the way, he meets Harrison, not the World Cup Professor Oak Harrison, but a fellow Silver Conference entrant. Once he arrives in Silvertown and signs up to compete, he sees that Gary and the World Cup winner Misty have also qualified. To make it into the group stages of the conference, Ash needs to win three one-on-one -on -one preliminary matchups. Up first, he has to take on Salvador and his Ferret. Blastoise is simply too powerful for the... ground type? I figured a ground Pokémon would be stronger against an electric type. Really, Ash and Misty had a terrible influence on each other, they're definitely better off travelling separately. After beating Salvador, Bayleaf and Cyndaquil win Ash's second and third preliminary matches, so without any real problems, he's made it into the top 48. From here, there will be 16 groups of three and only the top qualifier from each will make it into the victory tournament. The night before the full conference gets underway, Ash and Gary have a conversation where they basically discuss the exact things that I'm going over in this video. I wonder. If you hadn't come late that day, we might have ended up in two different parts of the world tonight. They end the night as friends and go their separate ways, ready for the groups to begin. When the groups are drawn, Ash finds himself up against Macy and the World Cup champion Misty, who defeated Jackson in the preliminaries. Up first, Ash takes on Macy, but it's a complete wash. 
Her trio of Slugma, Quilava, and Electabuzz are no match for Blastoise who sweeps through her entire team with Hydro Pump and Dig. Unfortunately for Macy, her team's made up of primarily Fire-type Pokemon, so Misty makes pretty quick work of her too. That means the final battle of the group, Ash vs Misty, will decide the winner. Having checked out her team on the computer, Ash selects Bayleaf, Bulbasaur, and Blastoise. Sadly for Misty, her monotype obsession puts her at a massive disadvantage. Bulbasaur starts the battle against Misty's Starmie, and despite the type advantage, a super effective psychic gives Misty the lead. Bulbasaur is dealt significant damage though, so Bayleaf has no trouble tying up the match. Gyarados is up next, and after a Razor Leaf connects, Bayleaf dodges a Hyper Beam. Ash recalls Bayleaf and sends in Blastoise, who strikes with Ice Punch while Gyarados is recharging. It's not enough for the knockout though, so Dragon Rage connects before a Skull Bash finishes things for Gyarados. That takes Misty down to 1. Her final Pokemon is her Quagsire, who Ash and Brock got to see as a Wooper in the World Cup. Not knowing exactly what she's capable of, Ash calls for Dig. While Blastoise is underground though, Quagsire uses Earthquake which destroys the battlefield, trapping Blastoise in place. The Water Starter, knocked out by the attack, is recalled, leaving only Bayleaf. Misty instructs Quagsire to dig down into the largely destroyed battlefield, knowing that any Grass-type attack will be devastating. After staying underground for a full minute, Misty instructs Quagsire to surface, but instead of striking with Dig, she pops up behind Bayleaf and connects with an Ice Punch. The attack seriously injures Bayleaf, but she recovers quickly to land a Razor Leaf that earns her the knockout. Bayleaf runs to Ash, tackling him to the ground in celebration. Ash and Misty shake hands, and she guarantees him that they'll meet again. Having qualified for the last 16, Ash checks the draw and sees that he'll be up against Gary next. It's been a full year since Gary breezed past Ash at the Indigo Plateau Conference. Both trainers have grown since then though, so let's see how this 6 on 6 goes. The battle gets going with Ash's Heracross facing off against Gary's Pinsir. The two bug types know each other well from back on Route 29, so their face off is a Tetchy one. They exchange several attacks before Pinsir attempts to catch Heracross in a guillotine. Breaking free of the Oko move, Heracross counters with a reversal, scoring a direct hit for the first win of the match. Gary is visibly shaken by going behind, but it's only brief. He calls on his Skarmory next, and with Heracross weak from its battle with Pinsir, one devastating drill pack is all it takes. Wanting a Pokemon who can match Skarmory in the air, Ash calls on Charizard next, who has returned from the Charizard Valley once again. The two duel for dominance in the sky, with Charizard eventually getting in behind to land a perfect flamethrower. Skarmory plummets to the ground unconscious as Gary returns him to his ball, sending out Alakazam next. Gary calls for Psychic to begin, but Charizard breaks free to strike with a wing attack that almost takes out Alakazam immediately. Defensively, it's not up to much, so connecting with a proper Psychic after wing attack is vital. It throws Charizard into the ground, but it's not quite enough for the win. Gary calls for recover, but Charizard returns to the sky and picks up Alakazam, stopping its recovery. Charizard takes the Psychic type high into the sky and then drives it back down to Earth with Seismic Toss. The physical hit decimates Alakazam and with half of Gary's team down, the match has reached its halfway break. Ash speaks with Brock who compliments his performance so far while Gary mulls over where things have gone wrong. When the battle gets back underway, Ash sends out his Noctowl and Gary chooses Donphan. Gary has been training hard with the ground type since it hatched as a fan pee from the egg that he won at the Extreme Pokemon race. Ash and Gary's selections go back and forth with powerful attacks, with Donphan setting up a ramp in the rocky terrain with Fury Attack. The ground type speeds off it into the air, slamming into Noctowl with Rollout for a KO. Ash is taken aback by the clever strategy and after some thinking calls on Primeape next. The fighting type is struck by the second hit of Rollout right away, but recovers quickly to land a Mega Kick. Dodging the third run of Rollout breaks the chain and allows Primeape to strike with Scratch, leaving Donphan weak. Gary calls for Flail next, which blasts Primeape off its feet, but with Donphan struggling to move well, the fighting type recovers in time to attack with Seismic Toss. The attack wipes out Donphan's remaining HP, but the energy expended finishes off Primeape too. That takes Gary down to 2, but Ash still has 3 Pokemon standing, so the advantage lies with him. The next face-off sees Venusaur taking on Charizard, so it's not a great matchup for Gary. Luckily for him, Charizard is quite weak from earlier, but it's still going to be tough. A flamethrower connects with Venusaur early on, but Leech Seed wraps up the Firestarter who never manages to escape. One more flamethrower clips Venusaur, but with Charizard's movement limited, a Solar Beam scores a direct hit, taking the battle into a 2 on 2. Ash still has Blastoise in his back pocket, but as the type advantage would definitely go to Venusaur, he selects Stantler instead. Charizard's flamethrowers have taken a lot out of Venusaur, but Leech Seed did at least heal it up a bit. Gary calls for Sunny Day as Ash tells Stantler to go for a takedown. The collision sends Venusaur skidding backwards as the sun starts blazing above. Gary calls for a solar beam, but Stantler just manages to avoid the powerful blast of solar energy. Ash calls for Hypnosis, knowing that's his best chance, but it fails. 
Venusaur's second solar beam connects though, blasting Startler across the battlefield. The normal type gets back up and uses Hypnosis which succeeds on the second attempt. With Venusaur asleep, Startler goes for a Dream Meter that drains the remainder of Venusaur's HP to take Gary down to 1. Unfazed, Gary sends in Arcanine who's delighted to see the sun blazing above when it enters the battle. Ash calls for Hypnosis but before the suggestion can take effect, Arcanine's powered up Fire Blast blows away Startler. When Blastoise enters the battle, it's on a largely even playing field. The Sunny Day powers up Arcanine and weakens Blastoise so it really could go either way. They start things off with a Hydro Pump and a Fire Blast meeting in the middle of the battlefield. They cancel each other out with a big cloud of steam forming in midfield. Arcanine uses the lack of visibility to swiftly close the distance and strike with an extreme speed that takes Blastoise off its feet. Now that they're up close and personal, they repeat the first moves of the battle but this time they both connect. Arcanine's washed back onto Gary's side of the field while Blastoise is badly burnt by Fire Blast. As Arcanine's takedown is met by Blastoise's Skull Bash, the sun fades behind the clouds and although they're both weak, Blastoise is spurred on by the changing weather. Hydro Pump meets Fire Blast once more but this time around the water type attack wins out, crashing into Arcanine at full force, knocking it out to give Ash his first ever win over Gary. The two old rivals walk to the centre of the battlefield and shake hands. Gary tells Ash to win the whole tournament so he doesn't look bad and with that, they part ways. As it happened in the alternate timeline, Harrison makes it through to the final 8-2 and he'll meet Ash in the quarterfinals. Unfortunately for the Pokemon protagonist, Blastoise, Charizard and Startler are all too fatigued to battle so soon after taking on Gary. Without some of his most powerful Pokemon on hand, it's going to be a struggle for Ash but he's not finished yet. The battle begins with Bayleaf against Kecleon and although Ash is unfamiliar with the Hoenn Pokemon, the Grass type's Body Slam gives Ash a win to start the battle. Harrison's Houndoom replaces Kecleon though and a flamethrower quickly ties things up. Totodile comes in for Ash and after being pushed to their limits, Houndoom and Totodile knock one another out with Bite. After Harrison sends out his Hypno, Ash calls on Heracross next. Again, it's a close fought battle but a super effective Megahorn eliminates Hypno so Ash goes in ahead at the break once again. When they return for the second half, Ash sends out his shiny Nocturnal and Harrison calls on his newly caught Sneasel. Luckily for Ash, it doesn't know any ice type attacks, but that isn't important as it turns out. Sneasel slash cuts down Nocturnal to level up the match again, so Ash calls on his Cyndaquil. Sneasel stays on the offensive and although Cyndaquil gets off a couple of attacks, Faint Attack almost does exactly what it says on the tin, leaving the fire type on the brink of fainting. Needing to find another gear, Cyndaquil evolves into Quilava and then finishes off Sneasel with a Flame Wheel. Unfortunately, without any energy remaining, Harrison's Steelix takes mere seconds to eliminate Quilava with Crunch. It also takes very little time to knock out Heracross, who's still weak from its earlier face-off with Hypno. The final member of Ash's team is his Muck, and unfortunately, it's a terrible matchup for Steelix. Dig ends up knocking out Muck, so without even using his Blaziken, Harrison has defeated Ash to advance to the semi-finals. As he now has Blaziken available to him, Harrison advances past John Dixon in the semi-finals and goes on to win the tournament. Ash speaks with him after his win and Harrison tells him he should go on to Hoenn to meet Professor Birch and discover some new Pokemon. Anything that allows Ash to see new Pokemon sounds good to him so that's his next plan. At the same time, Gary informs Ash and Brock that he's no longer going to compete in tournaments, planning to become a Pokemon researcher. After heading back towards Pallet Town together, Ash and Brock part ways with the former pewter gym leader needing to take care of some things at home. When Ash makes it back to Pallet Town, he learns that Gary has already left on a brand new journey. Inspired by his friends, Ash decides to venture out alone, leaving all of his Pokemon except for Blastoise behind with Professor Oak. As far as waking up early goes, it's barely affected Ash's journey through Johto because he's still lost in the Silver Conference quarterfinals. It's positively impacted Harrison though, who's now become the Johto champion. That was kind of anticlimactic, huh? I mean, I don't make the rules. Actually, I do. I could have just said that Bayleaf swept everything at the Silver Conference, and believe me, I was tempted. But the whole idea is for me to plot the series out in the way that I think it would play out and this made sense to me. At this point, Ash has at least now learned the lesson that becoming too reliant on one or two Pokemon isn't always the way to go. It cost him against Harrison, so maybe we'll see that play into his thought process going forward. Alright, that was like 200 episodes, so that's why it took so long to get around to this video and why it's so long. If people want to see this series continue on, then I'll get around to Hoenn eventually, but it's another 200 episodes, so don't expect it anytime soon. Okay, bye.